Hi, I'm Dr. Anthony Edwards, and I'm the instructor for Higher Education Finance. And today we're going to be talking about capital budgets without debt. So let's start with the operating budget cycle. So this is probably going to occur over probably three to four years, and it has three basic parts with some steps underneath. So first phase is the looking at the space needs and the campus plans. So here you're looking, at, trying to figure out what your space requirements are going to be, figuring out if you already have space on campus that you can use, and also looking at your institution's strategic plans, your master building plans, so if maybe if you have a site that you want to build a building on it, or the building needs to be repaired or demolished, you know, things like that. All right, the next phase you deal with feasibility and approval. Here you're trying to figure out if the projects that you're proposing are feasible, can you actually do them? Uh, given the resources you have in the current market conditions. Also, figure out what the different approvals you got to have. And so public universities generally going to have some state approvals, and so private institutions won't have those. Uh, so it just varies based on your institution. In the last phase, you're, you're building or acquiring. So you're, you know, making the purchase. You know, if it's something that you need to, you know, buy equipment, so you're you know, making that purchase or you're building out that space. All right, so if you're gonna fund new projects without debt, you're probably gonna do it through a capital fundraising campaign or you're gonna pay as you go and use your available fund balances. So through capital fundraising campaigns, the advantage is you don't have to go out and get debt for that. All right. The disadvantage is usually is restricted funds. You know, maybe it's funds for scholarships or funds for other purposes you know, to build a building. It's but specific for that. Uh, the other disadvantage is that usually these take time because you know. So if you have a hundred million dollar capital campaign, usually you're not going to raise a hundred million dollars in six weeks, right? It might take you three years to do it. So it takes a while. You don't have access to that money right away. For pay as you go, using your fund balances, again, you can use your available funds to do this, to fund, finance your capital projects. And remember, capital projects are things that you know, typically are gonna take a while, you know, multiple years to build out. All right, uh, typically it's gonna require future planning. You, know, you have to plan ahead to have the money, right? And then uh, typically because you're not, you're gonna have huge amounts of money available, this usually only works for smaller projects. Okay, another big concept for this chapter is the time value of money. You know, this isn't really a math class per se, so I'm not going to grade you on math, but I just want you to be exposed to the formulas. The big thing here is I want you to understand that, you know, you know, most of you, if you've been to the grocery store in the last, you know, year, you know prices have gone up. There's inflation. So generally, everything is going to cost more in the future, right? So there, there's a value, you know, like a certain amount of money it takes to do something today, it's probably going to take more money to do it in the future. So, you know, there's a formula in the chapter that talks about present value and comparing that to future value. So the present value is equal to the future value divided by one plus the interest rate divided by the number of discount periods or years, okay? so. It's a formula that you probably your, your finance department can use in order to help you calculate either the present value or the future value. So if you want to re-invert it so you can get the future value, you take whatever your present value is and multiply it by that, you know, essentially the dis discount rate or one plus I or the one plus the interest rate divide or with the subscript or the exponent is the number of discount periods. So you might know the present value, like, hey, it's going to cost me, you know, twenty-five thousand dollars to do this project. But what is it going to cost me in three years? Well, in three years, based on the math, it's probably going to cost you more because you know maybe you had to borrow money in order to do it. And so there's there's a in terms of the interest payments, you know, things like that. There's a value to how much it's going to cost you, right? Now, they also talk about what we call the the discount factor or essentially, you know, what's that variance between the uh, pr present value and the, and the current value. So, or present value and the future value. So you, you have one and you divide it by one plus the market interest rate to the 
power of the number of discount periods. So if it's three year project to be one plus R to the third power, okay? Again, I'm not gonna grade you on the math, I'm just exposing you to the formula. Okay, now let's talk about annual cash flows and choosing the projects you're actually gonna get to do. So, you know, the chapter goes through a bunch of Excel spreadsheets, talks about future value with annuities because, you know, institutions probably have some money that they're setting aside, putting in investments, just like, you know, you might have money in a savings account and it earns interest over time. You can calculate what the future value of what your money would be based on the interest rate. And it works similar with annuities. All right, they also have present value with annual costs. Okay, so you may have situations where, you know, you've got annual costs associated with operating something. So it gives the example of computer A versus computer B. It might seem like it makes more sense to buy the cheaper computer, but if the cheaper computer has maintenance costs that exceed that of the, the more expensive computer, it actually might be a better deal in the long run to get the more expensive computer. All right, and then you have the net present value and cash flows. So you're dealing with, okay, how much do you have today? How much money is that gonna bring you in? So you may, if we're gonna build this residence hall, okay, it's gonna generate some income, right? But, you know, we figure out, okay, how much money is that gonna cost me today to do that? How much income is it gonna generate? And maybe we have to compare that with, you know, maybe we're just gonna fix up this old residence hall and what the cost is for that and how much re revenue we can get for that. And that kind of helps us decide which is the better deal. Okay, in terms of choosing the discount rate, you gotta figure out what's most representative in your situation at your, at your college and the present economy. And that's really difficult to do. Uh, they give you a term called the hurdle rate, and here it's just what's your discount rate's gonna be that allows you to break even on your capital project, okay? Now, uh, if the fiscal environment's changing, you also, you may have to be conservative and you may have to increase that discount rate to account for the fact that, you know, maybe the market conditions are volatile. 